Welcome to the panel entitled Industrial Animal Agriculture, Environmental Justice, COVID-19, and Climate Change. Thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I would like to thank our silver sponsor, Tofurky. Oh, Tofurky, wonderful, wonderful company. I'm Joyce Tischler, Professor of Practice in Animal Law at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School, and I will serve as your moderator. For this panel, we're going to assume that you have some basic knowledge about the conditions in which animals are raised in industrial animal agriculture and the various harms that system causes to farmed animals, the environment, farm workers, nearby communities, and public health. This system will include pre-recorded presentations followed by live Q&A with our panelists. And now I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelist. Our first panelist is Kelsey Eberly. Kelsey is a senior staff attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, where she litigates and engages in regulatory adv advocacy to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals. Kelsey is challenging state ag gag laws, as well as deceptive and illegal practices by the meat industry, including uh, the meat industry. <laughs> she helps defend animal protection laws from legal challenges by that industry, as well as litigating and advocating to protect farmed animals at slaughter. Kelsey joined the Animal Legal Defense Fund as a litigation fellow in 2014. Prior to that, she served as a legal intern with Animal Outlook, formerly called Compassion Over Killing, and a legal extern to the Honorable Justice Lawrence D. Rubin of the California Court of Appeal for the Second District. Our second panelist is Naima Mohammed, who is the organizing director of the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, which leads statewide efforts and supports grassroots efforts for environmental and social justice. Working with Steve Wing at the University of North Carolina, Naima organized communities dealing with waste from industrial hog operations and co-authored publications regarding community-based participatory research, most recently in the New Solutions Health Journal. She also worked on the community health effects of industrial hog operations, a project in which she served as a community organizer, environmental justice educator, interviewer, and participant in qualitative data analysis. Her primary responsibilities on that project were to educate community members about the potential health risks of environmental pollutants, to help recruit and train individual participants for a longitudinal health study, and to serve as a liaison for the coordinated community-based organizations. Naima is also a founding member of Black Voters for Justice in North Carolina, a community-based organization that has addressed workers' rights in the workplace since 1981. Last, but definitely not least, is Jessica Culpepper. Jessica is the director of Public Justice's Food Project, which is working to dismantle industrial animal agriculture and create a better and more humane food system. Their three-pronged approach is to utilize strategic litigation to empower the historically marginalized communities most directly impacted by industrialized animal agriculture, as well as independent farmers and consumers. And to change the narrative we've been fed for too long, that self-serving massive wealthy corporations know better than farmers and the rest of us how to produce food. Led by Jessica, the Public Justice Food Project aligns itself with allies in like-minded movements combining litigation with community base building and communications to protect our land, water, and farmed animals, stand up for the rights of farmed farm workers, and create a food system that is accountable to us. Before joining public justice, Jessica was a Barker Fellow and staff attorney for the Humane Society of the United States in the Farm Animal Welfare Division, where she worked primarily on fighting pollution from concentrated animal feeding operations and advocating for federal and state policy reform to advance sustainable food systems and the humane treatment of animals. We will begin with the presentation from Kelsey Everly. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey Eberly. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and I'm delighted to be with you today to talk about an incredibly important and prescient subject, um, and that is uh, COVID-19 and the meat industry. So, you know, we're going to hear a lot today about climate change and the animal product industries and how you know, climate is affecting um, the meat industry and the meat industry is affecting climate. And this presentation, you know, will really be kind of tying it all together, talking about, you know, this large human-made crisis, not the climate crisis, a disease crisis, and sort of how it hit the meat industry and exposed some of the incredible weaknesses um, and the fragility of that industry and what that means for animals, for consumers, for workers, uh, you know, for all of us. So I'll just jump right into it to talk about industrial animal agriculture. So this might be you know, repetitive for some of you who know about factory farming, um, but just to kind of you know, situate us here to us you know, in the midst of uh, another crisis, which is the crisis of industrial animal agriculture. So as many people may know, um, in the United States, animal agriculture is dominated by a small number of, lar of vertically integrated corporations that control really every aspect of animal production, um, from the way that animals are, you know, their very genetics to the environments in which they're um, born and raised and slaughtered. Everything about the way that animals are produced is controlled by a small number of, of large um, multinational corporations. And we're talking about nine billion land animals uh, in the United States who are raised for food every year. Um, these animals, as, as many of you know, are subject to really near unimaginable cruelty, um, intensive confinement, mutilations, horrible living environments, dirty, uh, you know, unsanitary living environments, inhumane transport, and finally, um, painful slaughter. And these animals receive some of the fewest legal protections of any animals um, on the planet. They are often exempted from state animal cruelty laws. Um, and even when they are covered, enforcement of those laws is, is often you know, very minimal. So you know, this is some of the largest uh, animal suffering and um, the least protected animals. And this is, you know, we're talking about pigs, chickens, turkeys, cows. Um, those are sort of the, the, you know, the, the main animals. Uh, who are subject to this intensive cruelty um, in such large numbers. So, you know, a big question, um, talking about COVID-19 and the theme of this conference, you know, climate change, you know, what do these things have to do with one another? Um, what does COVID-19 in the meat industry have to do with climate change? And I sort of see it in maybe two ways. So, you know, again, on the one hand, COVID-19 this horrible pandemic is another disruptor of the meat industry. So it's um, something that is, you know, tipping things off balance, interrupting, you know, the normal processes. And so we can look at it at, as we do climate change of a disruptor and something that, you know, that, that tips the, the scales off balance. And we can ask what that does to the meat industry and what that does to animals and consumers and workers. Um, and of course, also, you know, others will go on to talk about how the meat industry itself contributes to climate change and how, you know, factory farming and um, the intensive use and exploitation of animals can contribute to disease risk. So, you know, really these issues are interconnected, but I'm going to be zeroing in mostly on the sort of first part of, of, um, of that connection of the effect on animal agriculture of this pandemic and sort of how the industry responded and you know, what the consequences were for animals and for all of us uh, in the United States. So I wanna start with this idea that you know, this pandemic was this unprecedented you know, history-making thing. And you know, I don't think anyone really disputes that it is, um, you know, unlike anything that we've seen in our lifetimes. But that's different than saying that it is unanticipated. So the harm that I'll go on to describe um, to animals and consumers and to um, workers, you know, 
it, it's, it's convenient for large meat companies to say that, you know, because this is sort of an unprecedented crisis, there was no way we could have um, you know, predicted for this and therefore, you know, uh, ameliorated some of the harms that, that befell workers and, um, and animals. And that is just false because for many years, um, the government has been planning for a pandemic like this and, you know, trying to run these, these risk scenarios and trying to force these large companies that have such an incredible stranglehold on the food industry to prepare for a large disrup- disruption that would, you know, impact their workforce, impact their supply chains. And the meat industry just refused to do that. They stepped back. They refused to, you know, the largest companies really just refused to put any resources or time into planning for a pandemic. And so when this uh, COVID-19 pandemic hit, they were completely unprepared. And it had devastating consequences for animals uh, and for people. And one of those, you know, consequences that perhaps most of you have, have read about or heard about is the effect on slaughterhouse workers. So if you know anything about slaughterhouses, you know that um, workers in slaughterhouses are some of the most, you know, exploited and exposed workers, you know, in society, even before a pandemic. And so when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, um, workers in slaughterhouses who have to work you know, shoulder to shoulder in these high density, fast environments that are, you know, some of the most dangerous working environments, even the best of times, you know, completely expectedly, the pandemic just flew like wildfire through slaughterhouses. So, you know, in the media, we've seen a lot of coverage of this, but these environments are, are, are sort of the perfect petri dish for um, the COVID-19 pandemic to spread. Uh, and and coronavirus infections to spread among workers. And so as of this month, October, uh, nearly 500 meat packing plants have seen confirmed cases. Over 43,000 meat packing workers have tested positive and at least 206 meat packing workers have died of the virus. And, you know, these numbers I think are very conservative because something else that the media has covered is the fact that, you know, slaughterhouses were trying to cover this up. We're trying to prevent the kind of, you know, thorough testing that would show the true impact of COVID-19 um, in their workplaces and, and among their workforce. And in fact, many of these, you know, slaughterhouses became hotspots, not only, you know, among their workers, but among their entire communities. So for example, in um, South Dakota, the Smithfield slaughterhouse, pig slaughterhouse there, one of the largest pig slaughterhouses in the country, essentially, you know, contributed to the spread of coronavirus all over that area of South Dakota and, and led to the deaths of, of several workers. And so that is sort of what we're, you know, what we're looking at. And these, this map of the country right here, these red dots are the meatpacking plants and the yellow dots and blue dots represent other forms of food processing. So you can really see, you know, the, the disproportionate impact that slaughterhouses have um, in this pandemic. So I, I use the term vertically integrated at the beginning. So what does that mean? You know, some people may, might understand that vertically integrated means that, you know, these companies control um, every manner, you know, every, every part of the production. They own the animals. And so, you know, when growers are growing pigs or chickens, those pigs or chickens might be owned by Smithfield or Tyson. And so they have one destination at the end of their lives, and that's a, a single slaughterhouse. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit the slaughterhouses and it caused them to, to close, to have to slow down, suddenly it led to this huge bottleneck of animals at factory farms all over the country who had no place to go because the slaughterhouses that they would have gone to were closed. And because, again, these companies own the animals and control so much production, th- these producers didn't have anywhere else to send the animals oftentimes. So what that meant is that millions of animals had to be quickly killed, mass killed. You know, we, we see these sort of incidents of mass killing of farm animals in times of disease. And in fact, the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service has a whole you know, program designed for dealing with 
um, you know, virulent infectious disease outbreaks that, that hit, um, you know, chicken populations or, or pig populations. And so they have these strategies and methods for mass killing of animals. Um, but never have we seen, you know, a, a crisis like the coronavirus that caused so many animals across the country to have to be killed, um, mass killed so quickly. And so we, we got these new sort of terms come into the, the lexicon, uh, depopulation, which is just a euphemism for mass killing, or the even worse euphemism, euthanasia. You know, euthanasia implies a single, you know, merciful killing of an animal in pain. That is not what was happening here. This was, you know, farms of thousands of animals being mass killed with an indiscriminate method. Um, so some of the ways that, that farm animals were killed or are being killed are through carbon dioxide being pumped into the barns um, or you know s- sections of the barns and as- asphyxiating the animals um, through captive bolt or gunshot uh, water-based foam that w- waves over you know washes over the animals like a wave and essentially you know, causes them to choke to death and finally ventilation shutdown which is perhaps the most um, notorious uh, method of mass killing. And that is when the ventilation to the, the large enclosed barns in which these animals live is shut off and the animal's body temperature raises, you know, raises the, the temperature inside the barns and essentially the animals cook to death. And this can take hours. Ventilation shutdown plus is where, you know, this method is used and then, you know, another method is used like carbon dioxide is also pumped into the building. So, you know, in its planning for these mass animal killing, uh, you know, operations that, that are um, caused by disease, you know, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, together with the, the um, American Veterinary Medical Association, sort of put, put forth these preferred methods of, of depopulation and then some, you know, specified some less preferred methods. And it emphasized that, you know, method the ventilation shutdown method is sort of a method of last resort that should be used only when, you know, other methods are not possible. And so, you know, we saw the, this crisis and hope that the industry would, would use those, that guidance and use the, like, the least cruel cool methods available. But unfortunately, that was not the case, uh, as I'll go on to talk about in a moment. But another concern, you know, other than the main concerns here, um, is what to do with all these, you know, thousands and thousands of animals, their, their carcasses of these animals. You know, factory farms, as we'll go into here, and from NEMA, you know, later on in the um, panel, factory farms are already, um, you know, such a threat to rural communities, to the health of people in rural communities. If you add on top of that, the on-site, you know, burning or um, burial and unlined pits of these animals, you know, just adds on to the um, environmental harm you know, that factory farms already cause uh, frontline communities. And those are some of the methods you know, of mass disposal of carcasses um, that, that producers are using and that we're seeing. So um, together with a coalition of other organizations, we stepped in to file two emergency legal petitions to try to get the government to not use the worst, you know, the cruelest, dirtiest methods um, of killing and disposing of animals. So on June 30th, we joined a petition to ask the agency not to use um, carcass disposal by unlined burial and on-site incineration because of the harms those methods you know, pose to the environment and pose to neighboring communities, particularly with air pollution, you know, at the height of the pandemic, burning animal bodies that doesn't seem advisable for public health. Um, and then we went on uh, several months later to file Another petition with USDA asking the agency to restrict its support for the use of the cruelest methods of depopulation, um, so ventilation shutdown and water-based foam. The agency responded to the first petition and claimed that even though it had set up um, a national incident center to try to you know, provide logistical and other support, even equipment to farms doing depopulation, um, that the agency claimed it had no authority or jurisdiction to do this, um, which is which is pretty remarkable. And you know, 
th these petitions came at a time when we had a glimpse into what you know depopulation really looks like. So um, in May, um, an undercover investigator captured on film a um, incident of ventilation shutdown at Iowa Select Farms that showed pigs screaming in agony for hours all night while they slowly were close to death. You know, and this is what the government you know, support for depopulation is going to, you know, to crop up. And so, you know, we hope that the USDA takes seriously our, our, our second petition and realizes that has both the authority and the obligation to prevent the cruelest methods, you know, to prevent taxpayer funds from supporting the very cruelest methods of depopulation uh, of, of farm animals. A second crisis that, you know, sort of, came about or, or, or um, got even worse um, during this pandemic was the transformation of animal slaughter. So at the same time that the slaughterhouses were experiencing you know, these, this wave of COVID-19 infections, they were seeking to speed up and um, change their, their inspection system so that they could slaughter more animals more quickly. So in the month of April alone, at the height of the you know, early phase of the pandemic, 15 um, chicken and turkey uh, slaughterhouses sought and received waivers from the USDA to run their line speeds faster than the regulatory cap. At the same time, some of the largest pig slaughterhouses opted into uh, the high-speed deregulated um, pig slaughter inspection system that the USDA had, had, just, um, had just announced uh, the previous fall. And the first ever line speed waiver was granted to a cattle uh, slaughterhouse in, um, in Kansas in March. And so at the same time that we're seeing, you know, waves of infection, the slaughterhouses want to speed up and they want to slaughter more animals. And this has devastating effects, not only on the animals um, who suffer in intensely as slaughter is sped up and there's not time to, to um, to euthanize or to um, render them unconscious before they're slaughtered, um, but also to workers. And I'm, I included here a couple images from an undercover investigation that um, the organization Animal Outlook conducted of a slaughterhouse that used or that uses this high speed model. And that showed, uh, this investigation showed, again, that um, animals suffer intensely under this high speed uh, slaughter inspection system. So in response, the Animal Legal Defense Fund joined a coalition of animal uh, groups to file a lawsuit challenging the pig slaughter deregulation. And uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union uh, similarly filed a challenge to that law, to that rule, and also to um, other grants of uh, line speed waivers to, um, to chicken slaughter plants. And we also saw enormous um, outcry from from the public and from Congress against these line speed waivers and against this deregulation of slaughter. So um, members of Congress introduced a bill to protect workers um, during this COVID-19 pandemic by halting the, you know, the grant of, of further line speed waivers to slaughterhouses. So those challenges you know, uh, continue through the courts where we're litigating um, our case and um, uh, groups representing uh, Workers, you know, continue to litigate their case, and we, you know, we, we're hopeful that uh, we'll prevail, and um, that this disastrous um, deregulation of slaughter does not go forward any any further than it already has. So we're really at a crossroads here. You know, the industry, you know, really wants to get back to normal, and at the same time, you know, what is normal? Normal was the system, the broken system that you know already caused so much suffering to animals produces unsafe food causes um you know terrible suffering to to workers and to frontline communities you know many feel that we just can't go back to to, to where we were before but right now you know COVID relief funds and logistical support that go are going into the factory farming industry are sort of ensuring the entrenchment of this industry in the way, you know, in, in these harmful ways, ensuring that it will continue post-pandemic. Um, and so we, you know, are kind of 
continue to fight for reforms, for fight, fight for greater transparency, um, because without transparency, there can be no accountability. And, you know, we're, we're going into the hurricane season. And so this disruption that we've seen from, you know, from COVID-19 is only going to get greater and greater as climate change gets worse and worse. And so we really can't go back to the broken, you know, food system of the past. We really need to transform, um, you know, the food system and ensure that factory farming does not continue to have a stranglehold uh, over how we produce food. So thank you very much. I look forward to answering questions and discussing this important issue with you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naima Muhammad, and I am the organizing director with the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. I would like to thank, thank the conference organizers for asking us to participate in your annual conference. Um, I've really been looking forward to it. I'm excited to be here, and I look forward to all that I will probably learn from you all today as well. Thank you again for inviting us. In North Carolina, we have been, for nearly three decades, we have been working on the confined animal feeding operations uh, problems here in North Carolina. In North Carolina, we have about not over, a little over nine million pigs. We have more pigs than people. And the top 10 hog producing counties in the country or in eastern North Carolina. Um, and what we found is that of the nine, the nine million pigs in North Carolina, mo the majority of them are in eastern North Carolina, sitting in predominantly African American, Native American, Latinx communities. And the problems that we've been addressing over this period of of pushback against this industry is the fact that they have um, what they call a their waste management system is called the lagoon the spray field spray field system here in North Carolina and because of the way that they handle that waste uh, it has caused huge problems for people living nearby where these animals are located um, they have the lagoon is nothing but a hole a hole that was dug in the ground that's about the size of a football field and it housed the waste from the animals uh, which is flushed into the lagoons through an underground piping system that runs from the hog houses out to the lagoon and it sits out there in the open air uh, until the grower uh, decides that the, the lagoon is getting too full, they need to empty it. And so to do that, they use industrialized irrigators and they spray the waste out on the crops and fields around the communities, um, causing huge uh, air problems uh, as, as well as ground contamination of the waterways in North Carolina. Uh, we have looked at health impacts of people living near these industrial hog operations and what we found through that research is that people living nearby have a lot of elevated blood pressures, high rates of upper respiratory problems, a lot of stress and anger for having to live like that. We also looked at a study um, looking at children within a five mile radius of these animals and versus children living five miles beyond that point. And what we found is children within the five mile radius have higher rates of asthma or more asthma medication and missing more time out of school than children outside of that five mile radius. Um, we have uh, you know, work with communities living with these animals, um, advocating for policy change, as well as um, asking 
our state government and our regulatory agency, the Department of Environmental Quality, to um, get rid of the lagoon and waste field system and move to cleaner technology. And there is cleaner technology that exists. In 1998, Smithfield, who's the owner of these pigs, um, at that time they were the only owner of the pigs um, until about four years ago when they sold part of their business to the WH Group out of China. And But prior to that, they were the sole owners of the over 9 million pigs in North Carolina. And so they in 1998, they entered into a, what's called the Smithfield Agreement with the state of North Carolina. And during in that agreement, they um, funded this researcher from North Carolina State University, $17.2 million to identify clean technology, uh, something that would be better than the lagoon and spray field system. Mike Williams identified five new technologies that would be better. And once he presented those technologies, Smithfield then said that they were not, it was not economically feasible for them to get this cleaner technology on the ground. And our state government allowed them to get away with that. Um, and, but you know, we, in our eyes and following the money and tracing the money in Smithfield, we found they was turning billions of dollars in profit annually. And so there was no economic reason why they could not get this technology on the ground except they didn't want to have to put profit over people. And so as a result, the state did not force them to make this change. And so today we're still battling with our state government and our Department of Environmental Quality to get this clean technology on the ground so that life for people living nearby these animals will be better. Um, currently, people are not able to just come outside anytime they like. They feel like they have to negotiate with the air. And they tell us this all the time. We feel like we negotiate when the air would get up in the morning. We crack the door open just a little bit just to see if it's stinking outside. If it's not stinking, we rush out to do what we have to do so we can get back in before the odor come. Because when the odor come, you do not want to be outside. Uh, the odor causes a lot of nausea. People have reported being nauseated, some actually throwing up. Headaches, watery eyes, burning noses, um, you know, just unable to tolerate the odor. And so they stay shut in in their homes with the doors and windows closed to try to keep the odor out. People used to be able to hang their clothes on the clothesline when they did their laundry. They have been forced now to go to the laundromat or to buy wa washers and dryers versus stepping outside, hanging their clothes on the line. Because what they were finding is when they hung their clothes on the line, if the odor came, the odor got into the clothing, you had to redo the laundry unless you wanted to walk around smelling like a pig every time you put your clothes on. And so they were forced to, you know, do uh, get dry washers, dryers, or go to a laundromat. Children had been teased because they had gone to school and the odor was coming through their clothing and they were being teased in school by other children of smelling like a pig. And, you know, so that caused a lot of stress for the children. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is as I've done this work over these, uh, over these decades working with, uh, uh, with peak communities is that, you know, children love to be outside playing, but we have found, and I have seen that when I go into these communities, Though I know there are children in the households, you never see them outside playing. And you know they're there because there's so many school buses riding through. Um, so you know they're bringing children home. So you know that the children are in those households 
but they're not coming outside to play uh, because they get sick from the odor. They get off the school buses running home versus walking home. And I think about when I was growing up riding school buses, it was so much fun. You get off the school bus, you walking with your friends and you just talking and playing and just having fun on your way home. And then to think that children can't do that because this industry has decided that they need to make as much money as they can at the expense of the people living nearby. And Smithfield always bragged that they are, they feed the world. And we always say, yeah, you do off the backs of the poor. Because what we found of the nearly nine million pigs in North Carolina, they are in predominantly African American, Native American, and Latinx communities and other poor communities. We call this environmental racism. We believe that it, these communities were intentionally targeted because they were perceived to have the least amount of economic and political clout to to um, fight this industry. And so they were, as a result, they became targets of the industry. It's like, if we go here, we know we don't have to worry. They, can, they don't have the power to change what we want to do. And then we have a regulatory agency that don't consider what will happen to the people when they issue a permit, then you also find these kinds of conditions. And, and I'm talking about the pigs right now, but it's almost any environmental toxic site that you want to find in North Carolina. All you have to do is come to Eastern North Carolina and we can take you to anything that I always say whatever white people don't want in their backyards, you'll find it in Eastern North Carolina. Because Eastern North Carolina is predominantly African American, Native American, Latinx communities and a very poor area of the state, it's a tier one county, which means it has very little economic prosperity in this in this in this area. And so um, we've become the dumping grounds for North Carolina. Um, so again, whether we talk about all waste or we talking about wood pellets or coal ash or landfills, you can find them in eastern North Carolina. Uh, the amount of degradation that's taking place here, uh, destroying people's right to clean air and clean water, which is a basic human right, um, the denial of people's right to enjoy their property in the way that they chose when they move into these areas. Um, it's just tremendous. It's a tremendous problem here in North Carolina. Um, you know, people can't just sit outside anytime they want to. Um, you know, so, and they are embarrassed to have company as well. It's like um, they say, well, when people come over, they want to know what is that odor and how can you stand it? And so people feel embarrassed from that. Um, they just, you know, for somebody to say, how you can, how can you continue to live here? Well, people live in these communities and they can't get out even if they want to. Their property has been so devalued by this dirty industry being near them that if they wanted to sell the property, they would have no buyers because nobody else wants to live there either. So it's a real problem. And the, the rate, the property values are down because of this unwanted land use. Uh, so it's just creating horrible problems for people. There was a class action lawsuit filed um, that in, involved 500 citizens from Eastern North Carolina that live in the areas where these confined animal feeding operations are. Um, the, the class was broken up into 26 groups and in 20, 16, the uh, cases finally got accepted in federal court. 
and they began having the first hearings in April of 2018. The five first, the first five hearings went forth, and the jurors in those cases heard the evidence from the complainants, and they, and of course, they heard from the the industry. And what they decided was that the the complaints that the citizens made were very valid, and they felt, you know, they awarded damages to the first five groups, uh, tremendous amounts of damages um, for property value, compensatory damages, and punitive damages to the tune of five million in in compensatory and twenty five in punitive and the courts reduced it because they said that it could not be more than three times the punitive could not be more than three times the compensatory. So that reduced it to like two hundred and fifty thousand in punitive, which was the maximum amount that a person could get in punitive damages in North Carolina. Anyway, Smithfield is appealing the decisions given by the juries, and so we're waiting now to hear from that appeal, and the rest of the cases are on hold as well. So there's still like 19 cases waiting to be heard. But what the what we found is that the jury the jury clearly made a statement to Smithfield it, that, you know, people reported the nuances of not being able to enjoy their property, of being made sick, of the lowering of their property values, that all of these things were valid in our eyesight and that you had other options and you chose not to take them. And so we find that, you know, you have harmed people in a way that's irre irreversible and you could have done different, but you didn't. And so now we believe you need to pay. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's what's been going on in North Carolina with the uh, class action lawsuit. Again, it's called a nuisance, the hog nuisance lawsuit. And you can look it up if you would like to learn more about that. Um, also, in 2013, the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, the Waterkeepers Alliance, and the Rural Empowerment Association for Community Health, which is a community organization in North Carolina, we formed a coalition and filed a Title VI complaint against the Department of Environmental Quality, who is the regulated agency here in the state. And we filed a complaint based on discriminatory practices because, again, wh where these animals are located and who's the most impacted. And though that was made known to them, they chose to move forward anyway and not give any consideration to the fact that they would be impacting the poorest people. And, um, uh, you know, and so we filed a Title VI complaint with the Office of Civil Rights at the Environmental Protection Agency, and they accepted the complaint. And uh, in 2016, they sent three teams of people to North Carolina to investigate parts of the complaint. And they were taken on tours around eastern North Carolina so that they could see up close and personal what people were living with and they interviewed about 85 people inside their homes while they were here. And they people were able to tell their own story about the impacts of this industry on their lives. Um, and then also the EPA people were able to see what people's home infrastructure was like, to see how that further um, exposes them because uh, the homes could not be as stable as you would like for them to be. Uh, there could be a lot of airways in the house where the odor can seep in because of the, um, you know, the, oh, the 
airways that there and so then people are suffering even inside their homes with the odors. Uh, people t reported to us about the tremendous number of flies and mosquitoes that was in the areas that were not there before this lagoon spray for the system was put in place. Also, the, um, uh, you know, people talk about the amount of snakes. They see more snakes. Um, I have literally, I have witnessed the buzzers in the communities and the buzzers are there because when these pigs die inside these hog houses they have a system called a dead truck and so they put the animals in the dead trucks i mean they put the animals in these boxes on the side of the road the dead truck come along from time to time and pick them up but while the animals are sitting out there they're riding and the odor is just sickening and the buzzers are lurking there to eat and and they are not even afraid of people the buzzers have become very territorial if you walk near up near the dead box and a buzzer is sitting there they look at you like what are you doing here and then they just continue doing what they do but it's a very devastating system in north carolina this lagoon spray fill system with over nine million pigs. So in closing, uh, again, thank y'all for my being here. And in closing, I would just like to remind us that environmental injustice is everybody's problem. And I I'll say that because I always say to people, if you drink water, if you breathe, if you eat, if you flush a toilet, if you run a faucet, uh, whatever we do in society uh, makes the environment our problem, um, everyone's problem, uh, because for every action, there's a reaction. And uh, so thank you again for listening. Hi everyone. Thank you to the wonderful Animal Law Conference team for having me. And thank you to Kelsey and Naima for those powerful and informative presentations. I'm here to bring this all together. You heard Kelsey talking about the horrifying impacts from COVID-19 on animals, slaughterhouse workers and their communities because of how food animal corporations like Tyson run their slaughterhouses. You heard Naima talk about the horrifying impacts on fence line communities because of how hog corporations like Smithfield run their production plants. I'm going to talk about how these two things connect. And even more, how corporate animal agribusiness is making us sick, figuratively and literally. What I hope you leave with from my talk is internalizing that the systems of oppression that are allowing these atrocities to animals, people, and the environment to occur are not inevitable. That all of us are connected and together we can make a change. The Public Justice Food Project believes that the root of the problems in our food system, everything you've heard about so far, is directly tied to corporate consolidation of power in our food chain. Our current system rewards putting profits over social responsibility the consolidation of control over not only the functions of the food production, but also the narrative, the story about who we are as a nation and as a planet that produces food have given corporations unprecedented power over our institutions. Our government, where our tax dollars go, and our laws and regulations and markets, that consolidation of power means that systems should be serving us, that they should serve them. It removes our ability to hold corporations or institutions accountable and has created a race to the bottom for the health and safety of our planet and everything living on it. In short, we see COVID, animal cruelty, and climate change as an end of pipe symptom of a system that enables and rewards extraction and exploitation. The question then becomes what to do about it. So I'll talk briefly about COVID because that feels really front and center to us right now, and then about climate change you'll find that the causes of these problems and the corporate false solutions share a lot of similarity. 
In the wake of COVID-19, public justice has pivoted a large amount of our organization's resources to standing with meatpacking workers to push back on the companies who are continuing to operate in a way that has set record profits for them while endangering the lives of their workers and families. But the conditions that make this job one of the most dangerous in terms of COVID exposure are the same conditions that make this job one of the most dangerous on any given day. The introduction of the virus was something the companies knew could happen, and they simply refused to act in any meaningful way because of the changes they would have had to make would hurt their profit margin. Workers, like animals, were simply expendable. So we brought a public nuisance claim at, based on a failure to provide a safe workplace on behalf of Rural Community Workers Alliance against a Smithfield meatpacking plant in Milan, Missouri. Immediately, they changed some of their practices, although we believe it won't be enough until they slow line speeds to allow for more distancing. But the court threw it out, saying that this is under the purview of OSHA. Okay, so we sued OSHA. That lawsuit is ongoing, and recently in a hearing, they said that they would never find a failure to socially distance or even provide masks a danger to workers. While we're hoping that this will finally get OSHA to act, if they say they don't have authority, it actually reopens the door for our public nuisance theory. In fact, a story just broke that shows industry lobbyists literally drafted the executive order they wanted passed, claiming they were operating in a safe way. The consolidation of corporate power is what's creating these conditions and false solutions. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to recognize what we see in terms of the disparate impacts of these corporations' operational choices. Just like the fence line communities you heard Naima speak of that disproportionately bear the burden of corporate agribusinesses pr production pollution, the workers who are facing the brunt of the harms from slaughterhouse conditions are overwhelmingly Latino, Black, and Asian. They are often immigrants and refugees. And instead of investing in changes that would diminish harms to animals and workers, Tyson's, for example, took out a full page ad in the New York Times saying, we take care of our family so you can feed yours. Which is why getting to the stories of the, those most impacted by corporate animal agribusiness is so critical. Part of our work, in addition to the lawsuits, is making sure that our clients and partners are able to tell their stories. That work disrupts the dominant narrative of corporate responsibility to feed the world and exposes it for the exploitative, profits-driven system it truly is. But so far, there's only been one tiny fine and only a handful of inspections as these plants all the while uh, are telling OSHA and USDA what they can say and what they can do. So issues like line speed changes that would not only protect workers from COVID, but a host of other problems, including animal welfare, is just not on the table. So the system works. The corporations drive the problem, then they drive the false solutions that allow them to continue putting profits over people, animals, and the environment to devastating results. Tens of thousands of people sick and hundreds dead, animals suffering immeasurably and disposed of in a way that threatens habitats, air, water, and those same communities that Naima just spoke of. This same system is allowing industrial animal agribusiness to act as a significant contributor to climate change. Global livestock emissions account for about 14.5% of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, but almost half of methane and nitrous oxide, the most potential and uh, serious greenhouse gases. Internationally, we've seen horrifying news about the conversion of forests to feedlots in Brazil. It is the single biggest driver of the Amazon's deforestation, and the single biggest meat packer in Brazil is JBS, which is now one of the US's biggest meat packers as well. In the US, which is what I'm gonna focus on today, we have different problem, mostly due to industrial hog and dairy production. Companies use confinement facilities and liquefied manure storage systems that emit methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. It's about 14% of all US agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. 
This is mostly caused by corporate desires for profit and the expansion of dairy cows and hogs raised in confinement facilities using corn silage feed and liquefied manure management systems. Take this industrial Wisconsin dairy, for example. There are about 8,500 cows at this facility. The enclosure stretches for six football fields and the cows are fed majority corn silage. The cows never leave their enclosures, never run on the ground, never eat fresh grass. Here's what the outside of that facility looks like. All of those fans vent greenhouse gases directly onto their neighbors and directly into the atmosphere. When animals are confined in large numbers rather than pasture raised, manure is produced in amounts greater than can be incorporated into the land at real time. So it has to be stored and disposed of like any industrial byproduct. Both hog and dairy industrial facilities use liquefied manure storage systems, which produce far more greenhouse gas emissions than dry manure systems. What you're looking at right now is a hog facility and those kind of pink ponds, that's all raw sewage, just stored in open pits. Right now, over 60% of US dairy production and 73% of hog production takes place on operations just like this one and the one you just saw. In the most recent inventory of US greenhouse gas emissions, methane emissions jumped 88% simply because of the uptick in confinement facilities. And much like industry's dangerous, quote, solutions to the working conditions in their meatpacking plants or the mass killings of animals that could not be transported to slaughtering, their solutions to the problem with their industrial waste is dangerous and only serves to further entrench the system manure to energy biogas. What these companies have been doing is seeking to use public dollars to pay for expensive equipment that turns their industrial waste byproduct into something that props up our fossil fuel system. For the science types, here's some more detailed information. Basically, they enclose their waste storage ponds to capture the methane and turn it into energy. That actually sounds pretty okay at first, right? Wrong. Like other fossil fuels, like natural gas, biogas emits smog-forming compounds, and the transport of it either requires diesel fuel or more gas pipelines. Not to mention that they still have to get rid of the leftover manure called digestate, which they do by dumping it on the ground and the surrounding land and communities. But that's not even the point. The point is that these are only considered positives if you believe we're stuck with the current system of corporate run industrial farmed animal production. Now, I don't think it's inevitable. What I'll say is that big oil is extremely interested in pushing biogas systems and a partnership between big ag and big oil that results in massive pipeline infrastructure paid for with our tax dollars is going to, it's gonna make the system far more viable even in the face of alternative proteins and farming options. It also makes it more viable because it creates a terrifying greenwash cover for both industries. Let me give you an example. It's only human to find inspiration in nature and also find answers. Our search to transform farm waste into renewable natural gas led Chevron to partner with California Bioenergy, working to provide an alternative source of power for a cleaner way forward. I've done a lot of dairy litigation and I've been at a number of these dairies. That sweet calf that was just born, it was born on a bed of manure in a cow pen its mother will never leave. You saw in the video that the cows came to surround the baby. They do that to protect it because they lose their babies the moment they are born. What that video cuts off is the calf catcher that I have per personally witnessed who is about to come and put that baby in a crate alone so that they can milk that mama and do it all again. Biogas doesn't fix that. So what do we do about it? 
that commercial was pretty convincing for the average person. These notions that they are finding solutions to continue a system relies on the assumption that the system is unchangeable. But I believe that COVID and our climate crisis are calling us to think radically about systemic changes and how to make them politically viable. How do we get people on board? First, we have to get the stories of the most burdened communities out there. Industry purports to speak for their workers by calling them family. They purport to speak for fence line communities by calling them neighbors, for farmers by pretending that's what they are, and by animals by saying this is a safer, better system. But that's not the truth. And these stories move mountains. Second, we have to build power. The systems that harm animals and destroy the environment oppress workers, devalue black and brown lives, and destroy farmers' livelihoods. If the only thing you're focused on is a win for animals, and it's at the cost of another social movement, it's not a win, because we will never really get the change we need until we can align and build our power together. Third, Organize around opportunities for structural reform and positive policy solutions. Even if we can't make a way ahead at the federal level and pass some huge law, fight like hell at the state and local level. Organize around the idea of what these policies stand for and build power. And demand accountability for what we want our food system to look like. No public dollars for biogas, because that's not the best we can do we can do better. Stay focused on the food system you want to see and the power and public you will have to build to make that vision viable. Work on articulating how that system will benefit animals, the planet, farmers, workers, all of it. It's critical that we be for something and not just constantly against it. And whatever that thing is, it brings us together rather than carving us out. Justice for animals, worker justice, climate justice, racial justice, this is all part of food justice. You can't have one without the other. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you. Uh, Kelsey, Naima, and Jessica, I was deeply moved by, by what you said. And we did get a number of questions. And so now we'll move to questions. I see a question that's asking if there are other campaigns to boycott Smithfield and other companies and to stop eating meat. And Nalima writes that if people keep buying their products and they are making profit, why would they voluntarily stop? Naima, are there campaigns to boycott Smithfield? Are you working on anything like that? No, we're not. But there was at one point because the work of that, the largest slaughterhouse in the world is in Tar Heel, North Carolina, called the Smithfield Slaughterhouse, employing 55,000 workers, slaughtering 39,000 pigs every day. And those workers were trying to become unionized and the company reacted very violently towards them. As a result, uh, communities and organizations in the state, as well as faith-based faith groups came together and supported the workers by boycott and Smithfield. And they, and they finally was able to get the union after a 12-year fight with the company for this union to get in, where the company was very violent towards workers. They beat workers up. They beat up the organizers from the UFCW union who were trying to organize those unions. Those workers, they hired their own internal police force and follow people around to make sure they weren't going to unionize the meetings and stuff. So they, they were very violent and vicious in their response to the workers trying to get this union. It took 12 years, but they continued to fight and they finally was able to get this union. And from the community perspective, what, you know, um, you, it's a, um, I guess you can say it's like a double A sword because you talk again, we're talking about very poor communities uh, who don't have access, number one, and the majority of them are in um, food deserts, so they don't have a lot of choices. Um, and then the 
sustainable meats that we that you see on the market are so expensive if you on a um low budget you can't afford the product so people are forced to contribute to their own demise by the lack of economic you know availability another question that we received is has anybody sued using antitrust law uh, would breaking up the big four create more oversight and better conditions? I think the answer to the second question is yes, but uh, is anyone aware of an antitrust lawsuit? Because I think I think that's a, a smart approach. I don't know antitrust law enough to, to know how effective that approach would be. So I well, can I answer a little know. bit. <laughs> Je Jessica, would you have a thought? Yeah, I mean, there is a number, there's a lot of private bar lawsuits, um, great antitrust lawsuits. There was just a huge one on poultry, on price fixing. Um, there's been pretty much every industry has price fixing lawsuits because this industry is so corrupt. Um, and the food project, we actually have a lawsuit right now under the Packers and Stockyards Act for uh, you know using monopsony powers um, against poultry companies. So I, I think the answer is yes, that, that is a very active place where um, people are using both kind of tried and true antitrust lawsuits and you know spaces like the food project where um, we're trying some new unique theories and that hasn't been resolved. Kelsey, are you are you doing anything at ALDF? Um, we don't have any antitrust work going on right now, but um, yeah, I, I guess just to speak to the sort of government part of it, I mean, I think finally we've started to see, you know, the government getting involved, like the um, price fixing lawsuits, Jessica, you were mentioning, you know, the government finally, you know, um, bringing criminal charges against um, some of the executives involved. Um, so, you know, I think we hope that that will continue because you know, all the harms that we were hearing about, you know, on top of that, the industry is, um, you know, colluding, you know, with itself to to keep prices higher and um, to gain more profit. So it's just another um, facet of this broken system. I have another question, and this one's for Naima. A lot of people um, in the Q&A expressed admiration for the work that you're doing. Um, and this question is, what advice would you give to animal advocates so we can support uh, the environmental justice advocates like you? Hmm. Well, thank you for the question because that has been discussed amongst us in the environmental justice movement. And what we talked about is the same thing that we talk about with traditional environmental groups is where they're always addressing everything except the harm done to the people. And so I think that if we could bring these two groups together, the rights movement and the environmental justice movement, that we could probably come up with some reasonable plan that would help all of us out. It would done to the animals. We, you know, we always say, we love animals, but we always notice that the animals get treated better than the people that we work with, you know, and so that's a real issue. Um, so I guess if there's a way for us to come together and work some kind of begin a conversation about how do we address environmental injustice as well as animal rights at the same time in a way that's agreeable to everybody where the focus is not just on the animals, but the human cost of this industry. I think we could start there. That's the best answer I can give. I, I, I agree completely. I think we need to work together across our various movements. I wanna thank all three of you for joining us. This was a wonderful panel. Uh, to our audience, thank you for listening.